the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were two of the most destructive events in human history. But did you know there are still some shocking facts about these bombings that many people don't know? In this video, we will explore these shocking facts and more about the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, stick around till the end so you may never miss any shocking yet exciting facts. August 6, 1945 dawned with clear skies over southern Japan, setting the stage for an event that would change the course of history. At 7.15 a.m., Colonel Paul Tippetts, Jr. piloted the Enola Gay, an extensively modified B-29 bomber, toward Hiroshima, utterly unaware of the catastrophic event that would shock the world. The Enola Gay's cargo hold housed a weapon unlike any other, the Little Boy atomic bomb. Captain William Parsons, responsible for arming the bomb, had already assembled its final components before takeoff. The stakes were unimaginably high, and the crew knew that one wrong move could make the B-29 the ground zero for an atomic explosion. The radio aboard the Enola Gay crackled with the signal from the reconnaissance planes, confirming that the weather over Hiroshima was clear. Tibbets adjusted his course slightly, and at 8 o'clock a.m., just 15 minutes before the atomic bomb drop, he informed his crew that the target was in sight, preparing them for the crucial moment. At 8.12 a.m., just two minutes before the scheduled drop, Colonel Tippetts transferred command to Major Thomas Freeby, the Enola Gay's bombardier, who could see Hiroshima below through the plane's nose. Freeby slightly adjusted the aircraft's trajectory as Tibbets followed his instructions. At precisely 8.15 a.m., the moment of reckoning arrived. Freebie shouted, bombs away. The bomb bay doors opened, and the little boy atomic bomb plummeted toward the city below. Tibbets immediately initiated a sharp turn, pushing the Enola Gay's engines to their limits. The plane groaned under the strain as it rapidly changed course. A race against time had begun. With every second that passed, the explosion of atomic energy drew nearer. The crew braced themselves, their eyes fixed on the impending catastrophe. At 8.15 a.m., the world was forever changed as the atomic bomb detonated, releasing a blinding flash of light and an unimaginable amount of destructive energy. Now let's move six years back to reach the roots of it all. How was it all planned, and what was the goal? Lies Meitner and Otto Frisch, two Jewish scientists who had fled Nazi Germany in search of safety, were racing against time. They had been closely following a discovery made by scientists Irene Joliot Curie and Pavel Savick working in France. These experiments unveiled the potential for massive energy release by bombarding uranium with neutrons. Desperate to reach Copenhagen before the outbreak of another world war, both to preserve their own lives and to share their groundbreaking findings with fellow scientists, Meitner and Frisch found themselves in Denmark there, they met the brilliant physicist Niels Bohr, who was on the verge of departing for the United States. Bohr eagerly absorbed the knowledge brought by Meitner and Frisch, and he was enthusiastic about sharing this transformative discovery with American scientists, including the likes of Albert Einstein. After their meeting, this group of researchers formally announced their findings. It was revealed that by striking uranium-235 or plutonium-239 atoms with neutrons, the nucleus could be split into fragments, releasing an enormous burst of energy. Meitner and Frisch coined the term fission for this process, laying the foundation for what would eventually become the atomic bomb. In 1940, as scientists across the globe continued to work on the concept of atomic energy, the mysteries of the atom and the fission process gradually became more apparent. By the end of the month, most scientists worldwide were acquainted with the fundamental principles of nuclear energy. The race to harness the atom's power had officially commenced. December 1941, four years before the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed Congress and the American people with a sad declaration. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor catapulted the United States into World War II, a conflict that would ultimately claim millions of lives, particularly in the war in the Pacific. In September 1942, 
General Leslie R. Groves assumed command of the Manhattan Project, a name derived from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Manhattan District, where the top secret initiative had its roots. The Manhattan Project spanned the entire country, but Manhattan had stuck as the code name for this unprecedented endeavor, symbolizing the epicenter of its origins at Columbia University. In January 1943, General Groves received progress reports from Oppenheimer, confirming they were inching closer to their ultimate goal. The government had designated a 580-square-mile parcel of land in Washington state for plutonium production, a key component for atomic bombs. However, local populations inhabited this land, a problem Groves considered solvable. Backed by the U.S. government and driven by the urgency of their mission, Groves ordered the Hanford, Richland, and White Bluffs residents to vacate their homes within 90 days. As April 1943 came around, the Manhattan Project kept moving forward, fueled by a sense of urgency and a strong desire to use the power of the atom. The stage was set for the atomic bomb to be made and used, which would change the direction of history and bring the world to the edge of a new era. Even though the Hanford plant was far away, it wasn't as far away as he would have liked. The idea of using nuclear fission to make an atomic blast had never been tried before, and it was still unclear how much damage it would cause. Even though it was unlikely, there was some worry that the atomic blast could spark the Earth's oxygen and cause a considerable firestorm that would destroy the whole world. Even though this was a scary option, Oppenheimer and his team on the Manhattan Project kept going because they were hungry for knowledge and had the power to wreck their enemies. Oppenheimer looked at a map of New Mexico and pointed to a remote area on the Los Alamos Mesa, 34 miles south of Santa Fe and in the middle of the desert. It was considered the best place to do tests without being seen. Week by week, Los Alamos saw a steady influx of scientists, engineers, and technicians, eventually numbering around 5,000 by the time of the first test. They collectively embarked on a journey toward creating the most powerful weapon the world had ever known. Amid these preparations, on April 12, 1945, the nation mourned the passing of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His death shocked many, as his declining health had been concealed from the public. The reins of leadership were swiftly passed to the new president, Harry S. Truman, who was promptly briefed on the progress of the Manhattan Project and the imminent atomic bomb. The pivotal moment arrived on July 16, 1945. At 5.29 a.m. sirens wailed across Los Alamos as the Trinity test was set to begin. The gadget, the first atomic bomb ever tested, hung ominously above the Alamogordo bombing range. With a glance at his watch, Oppenheimer initiated the experiment, commencing a countdown that could potentially lead to the destruction of the planet. Between 5 and 10 miles from ground zero, military leaders, scientists, and engineers knew it was time. They lay on their backs with their heads turned away and safety goggles on, waiting for their hard work to pay off. At exactly 5.29.45, the plutonium implosion device went off, causing a loud blast and winds as strong as hurricanes to blow across the test site. People turned around to see a 40,000-foot smoke cloud appear. The effects of the test were felt all over the country, not just in New Mexico. The blast could be felt up to 180 miles away, so the government had to make up a story to hide what happened. This huge accomplishment was a turning point, and Oppenheimer and his team were suddenly very aware of how deadly they could be. When Truman heard that the test had been successful, he understood how important the atomic bomb was. Even though the war in the Pacific was still ongoing, it was seen as a way to get Japan to give up. The United States was about to make a move that would change the course of history. At 2.45 a.m., five hours and 30 minutes before the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Colonel Paul Tibbets pushed the throttle forward. The engines roared to life, and the aircraft accelerated down the runway. Tibbets pulled back on the flight stick, and the plane lifted into the air albeit a bit unwieldy due to its modifications for carrying and dropping atomic bombs. A few seconds after takeoff, Tibbets felt a slight dip in the plane, making his stomach sink. He made some adjustments, and the aircraft began to climb again, prompting a sigh of relief. However, he knew that the most challenging part of the mission was yet to come. Two more B-29s took off from the airstrip on Tinian Island, 
a few minutes later. Their job was to check out the Enola Gay's targets to ensure the conditions were right for dropping the bomb. They would also record the explosion and what happened right after it. Once the Enola Gay was back on a level path, Captain William Parsons started putting the last parts of the atomic bomb, called Little Boy, on it. In the past, the bombs were fully put together before the B-29 took off for a test flight. This time, they waited until the plane was in the air and away from the base before putting the bombs together. Parsons transmitted via radio that they were ready, and the mission went on. Little Boy fell to a height of 1,900 feet at 8.15 a.m., just one second before the atomic bomb went off over Hiroshima. The gun assembly device went off, and when the uranium missile hit the uranium target inside the bomb, the bomb reached critical mass. It started a chain reaction that caused atoms to split and neutrons to be released, which caused a considerable amount of energy, and the atomic bomb to explode directly over Hiroshima. When the bomb went off, the temperature was very high, hitting 12,000, 600 degrees Fahrenheit under the blast. Everything around it, including people, cars, and buildings, immediately caught on fire. The blast wave destroyed two-thirds of the city's buildings, leveling everything in its path. About 70,000 of the 343,000 people there died immediately, and another 30,000 died within a year from severe burns and radiation poisoning. The thermal radiation blast left nuclear shadows on stone buildings, a frightening reminder of how bad the damage was. As the Enola Gay flew away, the blast from the atomic bomb shook it. The crew held on to their seats with the help of safety belts. As soon as the shaking stopped, Tibbets put the plane back on a level path and started flying back to Tinian Island. At 8.18 a.m., three minutes after the atomic bomb went off over Hiroshima, the smoke cloud continued until it was 40,000 feet high. Even though only a tiny amount of the uranium in Little Boy fissioned, the bomb's blast had the same effect on Hiroshima as more than 15,000 tons of TNT. The crew of the Enola Gay tried to figure out what their actions would mean, and some wondered how much the damage would cost. Twelve hours after the atomic bomb went off over Hiroshima, at 8.15 p.m., the Enola Gay landed safely on Tinian Island to cheers and praise. The Distinguished Service Cross was eventually given to Colonel Paul Tibbets for his part in the mission. The world would never be the same again, and as the news of Hiroshima's destruction spread, people worldwide tried to figure out what it all meant. World War II ended when Japan finally gave up, but the effects of the atomic bombs would continue to be felt for decades.